I want to thank everybody for being with us here today. We've had a, an opportunity to do several things. Uh, one is uh, before arriving at this particular venue, had the opportunity to uh, visit with about a hundred of volunteers who had come into this region from other parts of the state of Texas and did things like provide uh, ambulances, ambulance rides, uh, first responder uh, response like that, uh, whether it be for medical purposes or other purposes. The fact of the matter is be because in, in part uh, of the number of people affected by Hurricane Barrel, but, but really more be because of the ongoing power outage it's led to shortages uh, of beds available in medical centers and senior living centers and locations like that. And there was a necessity to uh, be able to provide the transportation uh, that otherwise was occupied. And candidly, we would, as a, as a community and as a state, would not have been able to respond uh, to the volume of people who needed to be transported without the assistance of volunteers who came in quite literally from Amarillo all the way down to the Rio Grande Valley. I just want to make sure that these communities that volunteered uh, here in the greater Harris County area know that wherever they are in the state of Texas, they and their communities are very much appreciated. Someone else who's appreciated uh, is Mayor Whitmire. The, the way that he and his administration and uh, the community of, of Houston has responded to uh, this hurricane as well as power adage challenge uh, has been remarkable and effective. And uh, as we were talking about earlier, there are several reasons that have buttressed the support to this event. One is collaboration. Collaboration among all of the local officials, but also collaboration at the state and local level. Uh, using the, the words of Mayor Whitmire, Every time Houston was about to have a severe problem, the state came to their aid. That was led in, in large part uh, by Chief Nim Kidd, who was next to me, and uh, the gratitude uh, that I have for the job that Chief Nim Kidd has done uh, cannot be articulated effectively. I, I think that the mayor, as well as other local leaders, agree with that. But to the point, the way they were able to partner together has led to a far more effective response. Another thing that, that Mayor Whitmer was talking about is the, the, the response they were able to achieve uh, was enhanced by their ability to work collaboratively with the state before Hurricane Barrel even arrived here, beginning a week in advance. Uh, the, the collaborative effort, uh, even though there was uncertainty about exactly where the storm was going to land, there was a certainty that we all needed to be prepared, not knowing where it may land. The point is this, whenever a tropical storm comes in or near the Gulf, all of us, state, local, and uh, other entities have a responsibility to get ready immediately. It is hurricane season in the state of Texas. That means that everybody who lives on or near the coast whether you are an individual, whether you're a government, whether you are a power provider, everyone has a duty to be prepared to respond to wherever that storm lands. The point going back that the mayor made is that because they understood that imperative, Houston was ready to uh, respond to that, especially working in collaboration with the state of Texas. Another thing that the mayor pointed out uh, which is something that actually we, we also did in the aftermath of the derecho. And, and that is power is down. That means more prolific efforts are needed by the state of Texas, by the Texas Department of, of Transportation, to, to make sure that there is going to be order at intersections in this community that otherwise has now been lost because of the lack of power. And so the, the mayor expresses gratitude, as do I, for everything that the Texas Department of Transportation has done to make sure that there, there's going to be control at our intersections uh, that, for one, will instill order, uh, make traffic flow better, but most importantly, to reduce the possibility of accidents and injuries in those areas. So as we gather today, our priorities 
remain the same as they do every single day but before a storm hits all the way through the conclusion of a storm. Job number one always is to protect lives. Now at this point in the aftermath of a hurricane you would think for the most part that protecting lives would, would be an issue that's already been resolved and typically it is. This time is different. It's different because of the lack of power. The lack of power provided by Center Point continues to compromise lives here in the greater Houston Harris County area. If, if you are without power in the extreme heat that we are facing, that alone can cause challenges. But also it reduces your access to uh, food in your apartment or your house, water wherever you may live or wherever you may need it, ice and other things like that. So what Texas is focusing on doing is continuing our efforts to work with local officials and our local partners to ensure that we will provide ready-made meals for anybody who needs a ready-made meal. We will continue to provide water and ice for anybody or any community that needs ice. Another thing that is needed under these scenarios is shelter. If you're without power, many people will need shelter. The numbers provided in our meeting before now is that there are a lot of people impacted by this storm that actually were already in shelters in the aftermath of the derecho who remain in shelters. Uh, there are about 40, more than 40,000 people who were impacted by derecho that were already in shelters. The point I want to make is this. Uh, be, be, because of the uh, uh, disaster declaration that was uh, granted, uh, that means that in individual assistance is available. The individual assistance includes assistance for temporary housing needs. If anybody is without power or for whatever reason uh, they may be facing, uh, they need to have temporary shelter until power gets back up and running, until your apartment or your home gets uh, in a situation that is habitable again. Just know that, that you have access now through FEMA for that temporary shelter. Another thing that is of paramount importance always in the aftermath of a storm, but especially because of the power outages, is to redouble our efforts to make sure that our communities are safe. And we as a state were able to partner uh, with the city of Houston, with, with Harris County, with local jurisdictions to make sure that they would have the law enforcement presence that needed to be enhanced because of the lack of power during the course of this event. The state of Texas has stepped up and provided about 80 Texas Department of Public Safety officers uh, as well as uh, brought in about 100 law enforcement officers from other jurisdictions across the state with the state of Texas footing the bill for those additional officers to make sure that the streets of the greater Houston area will be as safe as possible during this event. Another thing that kind of correlates with why we are at this location today, and, and that is there are and remain public health-based issues as a consequence primarily because of the lack of power. Because of the lack of power, there are all kinds of complications at, at hospitals, uh, at senior living facilities, uh, at assisted living facilities, where there may be an inability to discharge a patient an inability to take in another patient. And because of those complications, it was necessary to have what I will categorize as an overflow facility like what is happening right here uh, at NRG. For one, we thank NRG for uh, opening up the venue. But for another, I want to thank all of the professionals who were involved in setting up this operation to make sure that we would be able to accommodate anybody who needs access uh, to a healthcare provider uh, in this overflow facility because access was otherwise denied. We want to ensure that no one loses access to health care. Part of that process means ensuring also uh, that the uh, ambulances and transport facilities will be made available uh, for those patients uh, as they look to get to wherever they may need to go. Now, again, this is a collaborative effort by the state of Texas and by local authorities to make sure that all of the needs of local citizens and residents uh, are fully met. The big problem that remains, 
the big problem that is the cause of most everything else I've talked about already is the problem that center point has completely dropped the ball with regard to getting power back on. Now, yesterday I, I laid out a series of directives by me to center point that they must uh, get done and articulate to me exactly what they're going to do to, to meet my demands by July 31st. I will not go back over those today, but just suffice it to say uh, that the clock is ticking for center point to step up and get the job done. I know they're still responding to the current storm. However, they're making a huge mistake if at this very same time they're not preparing answers to the questions I laid out yesterday with the expectation that if they do not get that information to me, I will be prepared to swiftly issue an executive order establishing the guidelines that I think are most important to ensure that there will not be another disaster caused by lack of power in this region. And that will be an executive order on my part imposing on Centerpoint exactly the strategies that I think are going to be necessary to keep the power on. You will hear more about th that here shortly, in part, uh, but maybe some other things uh, from the chair of the Public Utilities Commission who is, will be speaking with us here today. The Public Utilities Commission uh, is, is the agency in the state of Texas that has the oversight of companies like Centerpoint. Um, that is uh, pretty much all I wanted to cover. Let, let me just uh, once again express gratitude to, to, to all of the volunteers I had the chance to visit with today, uh, to the people at this table, to the people uh, behind us, standing behind us here, for everything they, they're doing to work around the clock to ensure the most robust response uh, to this hurricane and to the aftermath uh, of the lack of power. The, the tip of the spear of responding to that has been the mayor of the city of Houston and a person that I've known and worked with for literally decades, uh, but who has stepped up uh, in, in an exceptional way to provide leadership in response uh, to this hurricane, uh, to this challenge. And uh, Mayor, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for everything you've done. Very proud of the effort that you provided. I'll turn the mic over to the Mayor. Thank you, Governor, and thank you for your powerful leadership. What we're demonstrating today is that relationships, experience, and collaboration works during a time of a crisis. Houston was prepared for Burrell. On Saturday morning, we were being told that we would get tropical winds and 6 to 10 inch rains, turned into a full-fledged hurricane with 10 to 15 inches of rain. We immediately went into a life safety mode, rescue. We then went through, and that is about the time that we realized we need to contact your emergency management team, which has helped us in the past. We were positioned and ready, had all hands on deck in our emergency center, going through departmental reports. We were prepared, and like others, we saw that Burrow was very unpredictable. Instead of northern Mexico or south Texas, it headed toward west Houston. We became the dirty side of a dirty hurricane. We worked around the clock, but immediately we saw that we had lost energy, and everything revolves around energy. It affects your rescue. It affects Houstonians' life and safety. So thank you for your powerful direct message to our center point provider. And all I can say is we need power. Everything we talk about today revolves around energy. Immediately we saw that we needed additional resources. We needed ice. We needed water. We needed to open our multi-service centers, not only for chilling centers. Unfortunately, I discovered that the city of Houston did not have fire stations with backup energy. I have learned a lot during this storm. I ran for office to fix things, and I discovered during a crisis you see your vulnerabilities. So what do you do? You use that relationship and collaboration with the state of Texas. With your emergency center, we immediately started getting additional public safety. We also had TechStock come in and fix some city traffic lights. They're doing it this morning. DPS came in immediately with additional resources. 
Thank you to all the stakeholders. But immediately we saw that we had a shortage of ambulances. Loss of energy was causing the hospitals not to release people back home to dark, unair conditioned homes. So we had a backlog at the hospital facilities. We immediately got 25 additional ambulances, some of the individuals we were thinking this morning. And then here's a new model. We've shared public works and EMS and other resources. The model of collaboration locally with other agencies with HPD was taken statewide. Your management team, NIMKID, sent us 100 additional law enforcement officers who I've worked with the last two nights on the street, providing additional public safety in our dark neighborhoods, getting back to that necessity of energy. Traffic lights do not have the generators. So all hands on deck, we're in a total mobilization. The last three days, we've made progress. We have more to do. Now we're in a recovery mode. FEMA, the Small Business Association, will be setting up centers with the City of Houston for this week. All I can say is relationships, collaboration, and experience is serving not only Houstonians, but our region. And there's things that we're learning, the modeling of collaboration with law enforcement, I think will be a model that we'll cross, take across the state. And I would be shocked if the nation doesn't recognize our success by collaboration with every facet of state and city government. So thank you. We've got a lot of work to do. People have a right to be frustrated and angry. I share that. I share that. We've got to be prepared for torna tor tornadoes, hurricanes and tornadoes, tur turning immediately change directions. We've got to relocate resources near the community. I understand you don't want your linemen and others to get damaged during the hurricane center across in our community. And let me just close by saying this to Houstonians, anyone who can hear my voice, these linemen are our friends. Quit threatening linemen. HPD is present at our staging centers. We'll escort linemen to their workstations. But let me just really plead with anyone who can hear my voice. Linemen are our friends in doing their job. Do not threaten them. I understand you're angry and mad and frustrated, but let's get through this together. And as the governor has instructed, we will do a complete assessment of all the stakeholders, public and private, and see how we can improve. Thank you for being here. And I want to thank all the stakeholders, law enforcement, EMS, public works. The state of Texas is in good hands, and we're collaborating with the city of Houston. Thank you. You got it. Good job. Uh, and, and now the chair of the Texas Public Utilities Commission, Thomas Cleason. Thank you, Governor. And I'd also like to recognize my fellow commissioner, Lori Cobos, who's behind us. So as the governor said, at the Public Utility Commission, we regulate Centerpoint. And part of our mission is to ensure that Centerpoint provides high quality infrastructure. And I think it's clear from the events of the last week that the quality of their infrastructure, their ability to maintain that infrastructure, and their communication with their customers has been called into question. So at the direction of the governor today, I asked PUC staff to initiate an investigation into Centerpoint's um, ability to respond to this and ability to prepare for this storm. Centerpoint has to do better. I cannot urge this enough. I have tried to stress with their executives that Centerpoint has to have a sense of urgency. What I've guaranteed to the governor is I will bring back actions that we can do immediately and not wait to address. I will expect those to be done during this hurricane season. We're still at the beginning of hurricane season. We have a number of things, including communication, that can be addressed right now. I've also committed that we will bring to the legislature and the governor more long-term fixes to address these issues that will probably need statutory change. I have every confidence that any recommendation the PUC brings with regard to improving the quality of service at Centerpoint and honestly all transmission distribution companies will have broad support in the legislature and by the governor. You know, when you do an investigation, sometimes you find out that it's people's fault and sometimes you find out it isn't. Honestly, it doesn't matter if it's Centerpoint's fault or not. It's their responsibility. When they decided to get into the public utility business, 
they entered a compact with their customers that they would provide high quality service because utility service, electricity is important to every Texan and every Texas business. And as such, we will look comprehensively at all of their operations and bring a report back in December of this year prior to the legislative session with recommendations for how to mitigate the impact of these types of storms going forward and how we can ensure that this type of response will never happen again. And Governor, I want to thank you for the direction you provided uh, to the PUC as far as where we should take this investigation. And we will be providing regular updates publicly at our open meetings and on our website and through our social media outlets so that this is done in public and is done transparently so everyone that's been affected by this can know exactly what we find. Very good. Thank you. And now, Chief of the Texas Division of Emergency Management, NIMCAD. Thank you, Governor, and thank you, Mayor. Life safety continues to be our number one priority. The strategy to protect life safety is the restoration of power. We continue to have truckloads of food, water, and ice available to support all of the jurisdictions that request it from anywhere in the impacted area. And, and Governor, I just I got to thank you for this team, this team of men and women that are standing behind me and the thousands of them that are across this impacted area that many of you will never see. They are working around the clock. Many of them are from the Houston-Harris County area. Their homes and their families have also been impacted by this power outage. And then we have those that have traveled from all over the state of Texas. I have to take a minute, a minute to recognize Dr. Jennifer Shuford, the Commissioner of Health from the Department of State Health Services. Dr. Shuford and her team have provided the EMS assets to help support this city, along with the rest of the teams, and then the community from National EMR, our nonprofit, non-governmental organization that's helping set up this medical shelter that's here. Also, as additional counties continue to be added for individual assistance, please help us share the telephone number and the website address so that all people impacted by this storm that are eligible for individual assistance register. As Governor said, we have about 40,000 Texans that are still in hotels and additional shelter right now from the last storm that came through. All of those that are impacted will have to re-register in accordance with FEMA rules. We have asked them to allow duplicate registration. They have said they cannot. So we need your help in getting that message out for those to re-register with FEMA.gov under disasterassistance.gov so that they, too, can become eligible for additional assistance. Thank you, Governor. Very good. Uh, thank you. We'll be happy to take a few questions. Good. Could I admonish Go ahead. Uh, or advise Houstonians with this heat, go to City Cooling Center, your libraries, your multi-service center. Multi-service centers will be distributing ice and water. Everyone's going to have to stay hydrated and get to a cooling center when you need additional ice and water. Very good. Go ahead. Okay, can, can I get you to speak louder? So a, a couple of points. One is my exact, if CenterPoint does not comply with my request, I will be issuing an executive order imposing what, what I think are the appropriate standards. Here's the point. The, the standards I will impose on CenterPoint will be far more costly than what they may be coming up with. Separate from that, if they don't comply with my request and refuse to, to work with us, then we, we're going to completely reevaluate. Uh, the current status uh, of Center Point in our area. A couple of points. One is Center Point currently uh, is seeking to recover a profit or a rate of return uh, on the expenses that they are, are about to undertake. And uh, that decision is going to be made by the Public Utilities Commission in October. Uh, if Center Point does not comply, I, I will be arguing before the Public Utilities Commission to not provide center point with any profit. But the, the ultimate one, which is stronger, and that is what center point is showing us by its repeated failure to provide power, is they seem to be just incapable of doing their job. As a result, we will have to consider, the state will have to consider, whether or not we, we should be reducing the size of the territorial region to make it smaller so maybe they can do a better job of managing it. So the, on the passing of any of that cost to customers, uh, the, the decision about authorizing that or not authorizing that 
actually is by the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, they're going to be through, going through that assessment process in October. And so we will be able to see all the cards on the table uh, by what Centerpoint has or has not done uh, before any uh, ability is given to Centerpoint to recoup any of their costs. For, for, for me, it is. Yeah, Governor, if I could add. So, yeah, so Centerpoint has filed what's called a resiliency plan with the commission. That is their plan to harden their, their current infrastructure and make it more resilient to things like severe weather. Those plans are in front of us. As the governor said, we'll make a decision on whether or not to approve or deny that plan uh, in October of this year. And then they also have a rate case before us where we get to determine whether or not they should be allowed to pass on those costs to their customers. So that deliberation will happen. We will make that decision in public sometime later this year or early next year. No, there's, there's you know, from my observation, uh, there's nothing that the PUC uh, has done or failed to do. So remember this aspect, and that is during this storm, it's impacted multiple regions, uh, and there have been literally dozens, if not close to 50 or so, power companies involved in this process. This isn't a failure of the entire system. This is an indictment of one company that's failed to fulfill its job as well as all the other power providers. And so the, 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 all of the issue is focused on one company, uh, and that's Centerpoint. What the role that the PUC has uh, is to make sure that they hold Centerpoint accountable for their failure to deliver power in response to this storm. Sure. So take communication, for instance. We'll have recommendations around their communication, best practices for communicating in an emergency event that they failed to meet. Those can be implemented immediately once we identify them and come up with solutions. Some other issues are going to take longer. So one of the things that I've heard as chairman is vegetation management has been an issue. Right now, Centerpoint can only cut the trees that are within the right-of-way for its utility lines and poles. One of the things that other states have done is in areas that may be affected by falling trees, they've given utilities greater latitude to cut back those trees beyond just the right-of-way that they own. And so that's one thing that would take a statutory change, and that's symbolic of the type of changes that would need legislative change that would take longer to implement. It would, so we were already doing this informally. We had Centerpoint before us at our last open meeting last Thursday. Uh, they came and gave us an update and answered questions. Based on the governor's directive and the direction he's given us, we've formalized that investigation. Like I said, the main reason to do that is so it can be done publicly. Everyone will get to follow along. We will post on our website. We will give updates during our open meetings. Our next open meeting that will be held publicly is on July 25th. I've requested that the management of Centerpoint come and be there and answer questions again to get an update on where they are meeting the directives from the governor and what he asked for by the end of the month, and also to bring us options for how to address the short-term fixes that we need done now as we go through the rest of hurricane season. So this will have no impact on residential customers' bills at the end of the month. This will have nothing to do with that. No, no. as a result of this, they will not see any increase in their utility bills right now. Absolutely not. Would you repeat the first part of the question again? Oh, right, right, right. All right you so I was, I was out embedded in the field this morning with Centerpoint. Their crews are still working. 
they are hopeful that they'll be down to about 5% out by the middle of this week, by Wednesday. And the goal is still to have 100% restoration to the homes and businesses that can actually receive power. They aren't so badly damaged that they can't even receive power by the end of the day on Friday. Yes, yeah, so the governor directed us to have our findings and recommendations to him in the legislature by December 1st, and we'll meet that deadline. Yes, if there are issues that can be addressed without statutory change, we will ask and direct Centerpoint to make those immediately. We, the urgency of this cannot be expressed enough. We don't have time to wait. As we, like I said, we have a long way to go in hurricane season. These issues that can be addressed now have to be addressed now. So what we can mandate Centerpoint to do, we will be doing so to Centerpoint. Recommendations that we need approval for, changes in statute, for instance, we will give those recommendations to the legislature and to the governor. So any of the EMTF resources?